What's up, everybody? Top of the evening, top of the morning, wherever you are. Sunday Sessions, episode 43, where I deliver tons of information to help you scale out your e-commerce business. My name's Eric Castellano. Super excited to be here. And I hope everybody's enjoying their life, spending time with family, doing what matters. Because the nine to five, the day to day grind, all of that is awesome. But if you're not enjoying your life, what's the point? What is the point? There is no point. What's up, Nikki? What's up, everybody? So just to give you a rundown how this works, you post questions and I answer. Very simple. What's good? What's good? What everybody got going on today? I just had some calls. I got another call in about an hour, and then I'm going to go pick up some gardening supplies because I got some plants I got to plant on my balcony. Oh, let me give you a rundown of the calendar that's happening. So we will be in Austin for SellerCon. Um, I think it's 1st and 2nd of June will be in Austin um, at SellerCon. So we'll probably do a meetup out in Austin. Um, and then at the beginning of August, we'll be in Chicago at Ecom Summit. And then at the end of August, we'll be right here in Newark, New Jersey at AMZ United. So those are a few of the events we'll be attending. Um, and I encourage you to get to the events, right? A lot of magic happens at events. It gives you the opportunity to network with other sellers, learn what's working and what's not. So you can immediately implement those things into your company. I think networking has attributed to a, a large percentage of my success, right? Being in the right rooms with the right people and not being afraid to pay to be in those rooms to get next to the right people. I think really that's the level up. Yeah, so Nikki asked, Eric, can you talk about gray market goods and how to avoid them? A lot of distributors don't want to give away their supply chain documents because it will show who they are buying from. So I've never met one distributor, Nikki, who's wanted to give their supply chain documents. So it's just part of the game. And it, it, at the end of the day, right, it's it's you build relationships with preferably reputable companies and you purchase their products to resell on Amazon. As far as figuring out which ones are gray markets or what we call diverters, right, it's challenging to do so. And whether they're diverter, gray market, legit, nobody's giving you your, their supply chain invoices. It's just impossible to get. So we operate business as usual. We just continue to purchase the products. And then when we deal with those account health issues where Amazon's asking for supply chain, our supplier supplier, unfortunately, we just don't submit that documentation. First of all, it's not good for business. My suppliers don't want me giving away their suppliers. That's why they don't give me the information. So Nikki, it's just part of the game, man. Yeah, this is another great question. So Paul asked, I'm currently doing mostly OA, which I'm sure a lot of you are currently doing right now. Um, 402,000, congratulations in the last 12 months in, in sales. Would I recommend pivoting to wholesale? or a hard shift. I would recommend the pivot. A hard shift into any new business model just doesn't make sense because your, your sales are going to drop. Right now you have a system in place that's generating $400,000 a year in sales revenue. You don't wanna stop that, you wanna continue that. So what I would do is allocate a percentage of my time, let's say 20%, 25% of my weekly time, allocate that initially into building wholesale relationships. This will get you some skin in the game. This will get you some momentum because you're not going to be able to make the full transition overnight. For us, it took about 18 months to make a full transition from retail arbitrage to wholesale. And for a lot of people, it's going to take some time. So, Paul, I encourage you to start now. So six months from now, you're in a much better position and you'll have a smoother transition from OA to wholesale. So for buy box suppressed listings or lost buy box ASINs, what are we doing with those? So uh, first thing you always wanna do, if a buy box is suppressed, if you pop it to Seller Central, it will give you the recommended price on manage inventory. Um, that's the price they suggest listing it at. So we usually will try to match that price. Also something else you can do is search the UPC on Google. Typically if a buy box is suppressed, it's because Amazon has found another large marketplace uh, like Walmart or Target, um, selling the same exact product for a cheaper price. So they essentially suppress your buy box. So they're not advertising that product at a higher price on the internet over these other companies. 
Um, another reason why the buy box may be suppressed is if you pop into manage inventory and you click edit listing, sometimes there'll be a red box around missing information. And if the ASIN is missing pertinent information, Amazon will suppress it because it's not delivering the customer the information they need to make an educated buying decision. Now, usually we find, and this is a nugget for all of you, we usually find whatever the recommended prices Amazon provides, we can usually get the buy box at 10% over that. So if they are saying you need to be at $15, we'll typically be able to get that buy box unsuppressed at $16.50. So it's something to, it's something to definitely try. Uh, what do you think about Amazon lending as a smaller seller? They offered me 7K, but at like 15%. Yeah, so 15, I, first of all, Amazon lending was a huge driving factor for our business early on. Uh, there was a point in time, probably in 2018, 19, where they were giving us a couple million dollars a year, which was massive. Um, so I encourage people lever leveraging Amazon lending, but a 15% is way too high for the 7K, 15%. I would deny that, and usually they'll come back with a lower um, interest on that loan. So I would not take that loan, I would deny that loan, and I'd give it a couple weeks, and most likely they're going to decrease that interest rate. And also, the only way to get larger loans from Amazon is to start taking them, right? But you don't wanna go taking loans at 15%, unless your margins are crazy, which I would imagine if you're in the OA or RA or wholesale space, your margins aren't even crazy. And even if you're in the private label space, after advertising and shipping from overseas and coupons and lightning deals and all of that, your margins aren't phenomenal either, right? So it's like 15% on a loan or a credit limit is pretty high. Yeah, Nikki, are you an e-sellers or I, man? Because you're asking some phenomenal questions and literally like our warehouse structure, we give you the breakdown of, um, you know, staging, receiving, packing, prepping, like all of that is thoroughly broken down. I don't really think on this call uh, we got the time to, to really dive into optimizing a warehouse. Uh, but I'd love to, to assist you inside our community 100%. Um, oh, so this is a great question. Telegram wholesalers. So quick little story, and I do not do any business with Telegram wholesalers. Um, I usually find that newer sellers typically do business with Telegram suppliers because they're having trouble opening wholesale accounts. But here's the thing with Telegram suppliers. The guy in my community just yesterday had a phone call with Sebastian. His account got suspended. Why did he get suspended? He bought products from a Telegram supplier. Turns out that Telegram supplier was purchasing stolen inventory there's a there's an article on YouTube you can you can search I don't remember what it's called but I think it's it's fifty million dollars stolen inventory California search that on YouTube you'll be able to see it right but so a lot of these Telegram distributors are getting access to that inventory and now here's here's the difference between making a decision to buy from a Telegram distributor and not making a decision and this is the red flag that they came up for this gentleman and he completely ignored it but this Telegram supplier had these um blenders at like 25 percent of what they normally are in any other catalog so let's say in a normal catalog they're 100 bucks the telegram guy was selling them for 25. instant red flag anything that's too good to be true usually is right if you're buying inventory 75 percent discount you gotta question a little where that inventory came from did it fall off the back of the truck so this dude got his account suspended. And of course he told us he did absolutely nothing wrong. And through a phone call, we found out he was buying uh, products from Telegram distributors. Um, now I do know a few companies who operate on Telegram and they're legit, but we don't communicate with them through Telegram. We communicate with them through email because the Telegram, this is the last thing before we move on. Telegram, it's nuts. It's like you get a deal, you literally got to jump on a computer, research it immediately, respond to that Telegram chat to get access to it. Because if you wait 20 minutes, someone else already jumped in and bought it, right? And then also something I don't like is they usually don't share the amount of quantity they have. They'll put an MOQ, right? So let's say they have an MOQ of 100 units, but they have 10,000. You know, so now you buy 100 units, another Amazon seller buys 100 units, another Amazon seller buys 100 units, another Amazon seller buys 100 units. And in six weeks, the listing has dropped 20, 30 dollars and it's no longer profitable because this Telegram distributor had thousands and thousands of units. So I per personally don't work with any.
Uh, where can you get funds to fund your business? I always recommend starting with credit first. Credit is huge. It will help you build a uh, credit score. And if you have shitty credit, um, you got to start somewhere, right? You got to open a card, even if it has a lower limit, a couple thousand bucks, start using it, paying it back, and then request a limit increase a couple months down the road so you have access to more capital. So credit is huge. Also, you can take out private bank loans. Amazon Lending, which we just discussed, is another option. Uh, you can partner up with a business partner who maybe has a cash injection. It's tough though when you're when you're when you're partnering up with somebody, especially with cash, because usually they just want a percentage of the business and they don't want to put in any of the work. They just want to give you the money. So you definitely got to weigh the pros and the cons of that. Because I'm I'm a firm believer. I don't like giving up a percentage of my company um, unless it's absolutely necessary. Like absolutely necessary. Suppress means that there's no visible buy box on the on the ASIN. So like when you pop up an ASIN on a phone, there'll be a seller in the buy box, but or or on a desktop. But if it's suppressed, you actually have to click where it says more offers. What percentage of our ASINs are replenishable? Probably 40%, maybe 40 to 50%, I think. That'd be a good guesstimate. And then the other 60 to 50% is uh all just new new product, new products that we're picking up. So here's the thing with replenishables, right? People think that because you have a replenishable item, it's something that you're consistently selling year round, right? Also, it's okay. And we just did this yesterday. We have a product right now that's doing about seventy thousand dollars in sales revenue a month and the margins are very high we're like 28 30 percent you know so we're making a nice chunk of money on this listing but now all of a sudden the offer count tripled so it went from like 10 sellers to 30 sellers and our margins dropped from like a 28 percent to like an eight percent right so yeah this has been a replenishable product for us for about nine to ten months and we've been consistent with it but now based on the landscape of the listing with the increase in sellers right so there's a higher supply which means the price will go down it's basic economics we're stepping away from that listing and it's perfectly okay we'll check back in 30 days Right. We'll let all the sellers that are doing their their com competition to the bottom. We'll let them fight it out to the bottom. Right. They'll realize they don't want to replenish that inventory anymore because they got murdered on it. And then 30 to 45 days, we'll slide back in on that listing and be back at those high 20 percent margins. You know, every listing and ASIN on Amazon has a life cycle. It's super important to start exploring these life cycles. Pop open that keep a chart. Right. By default, your keeper chart should be set at one year when you're popping open the listing. But if the listing's been around for four or five years, pop open the keeper chart. Look at the flows, the ebbs in the BSR. You'll see it go down and up. You'll see how it affects the price when the BSR changes. You'll also see in that third keeper chart when you're analyzing the competition, the offer count will also play a huge role in where the price is going, whether it's going up or down. Usually the higher offer count, the lower the price, right? So it's important to understand these trends in Amazon because every single product on Amazon.com has a trend like this, you know? And if you're able to recognize it, you can catch it on the way up instead of catching it on the way down. Managing cash flow and paying yourself. Been tough. Can I feel like I'm not making enough money at times since I'm not seeing it in my pocket, but in reality, I'm profitable. So this is what I recommend um, for Amazon sellers, right? paying yourself a weekly or bi-weekly salary. Now, in year one, it's going to be very tough to determine what that is because you're just learning the game. The, the products are just moving. And usually what I suggest, if you're just getting started on Amazon, I hope it's not your only form of income, right? So you're not taking cash out of the business to live off of, especially in the first year. The more you can reinvest into the company, the quicker it will grow, right? So after year one, who asked that question? Adam? Adam. Adrian. So the quicker in year one, you'll have that data, right? And then you'll be able to analyze it on a monthly, quarterly basis. And you'll have an understanding of how much profits you're making, right? Because you'll know your expenses. You'll know the money that's coming in from your disbursement checks from Amazon. And then it's just basic math of subtracting your expenses from your, from your gross profits. And then you have your net profit dollar amount. And then taking that number and deciding, hey, out of this net profit dollar amount, I'm comfortable taking out of my business, paying myself 
$1,000 a week. And you set that number and it's essentially payroll, right? So it's calculated into the business. Um, and then you continue to analyze those numbers. And what we like to do is set a, a salary for ourselves. And then at the end of the year, based on the performance of the company, we take what's called a draw, right? Because at the end of the year, you're going to have a much better understanding of the actual profits that you made, right? Because you got to pay taxes. You maybe give your employees some bonuses, whatever the case may be. But at the end of the year, your CPA is going to put together some information, really giving you the transparency into your company to know exactly how much money you made. Right? So I recommend paying yourself a salary to put money in your pocket. And then at the end of the year, taking a draw against the total profits in the company. Yeah, source correct. Diego asked what source correct is. So Source Corrects is software my business partner, Sebastian, who a lot of you know, has been working on for about two and a half years. Um, essentially, it's something that just doesn't exist in the marketplace yet. It's the most advanced UPC scraper. It generates your purchase order for you. It instantly creates your listings on Amazon. Right now, we're beta testing 2D uh, barcodes for shipment creation, as well as inventory management. So it's a, it's a software that's literally helping. Right now, we have 40 people testing it in beta in our inner circle, and they are loving it. The, the, the speed in which they're putting orders together is truly mind-blowing. Their accessibility to the products, because it's essentially a cloud, right? It stores all your data. So... For example, Scan Unlimited, a lot of you guys are using or tactical arbitrage, whatever it may be. Like none of those are saving any of that data in there. Every time you rescrape a sheet, you have to literally go through the entire thing at all over again. But what SourceCorrect does is it saves all of that data for your company. So we are essentially building a database for you to allow you to continue to leverage growth in your own business. It's next level. It's probably one of the key factors that took us from like 25, 30 million a year to where we are now at like 65. It literally doubled our business in the efficiency and the way it helped us purchase products. So it's a game changer. Well, this is a great question. This is a huge topic in our company. We actually have entire hour meetings about this, especially in the past couple of weeks. Um, but how do you liquidate inventory that's sitting too long, right? So say you got some inventory, um, it's been sitting in Amazon, you sold a little, you made some money, and now the rest of it, whether the category disappeared, the category node, um, and you've tried updating it, and you can't, so it's not selling, the competition is too high, the price has dropped, whatever the case may be. Um, we're, way, we're literally analyzing these products individually, and we're documenting a few things. So the first thing you want to look at when you're analyzing a product and making a decision to look at uh, to liquidate, first thing is 365 day profit. How much money have you made on it in the past 365 days? Because it's very common that you you expand that 365 day view and you made three four thousand bucks, and now you got 20 units left that you got to lose three dollars on, and you're like you're so stuck on the three dollars, but because you didn't expand it into the big picture, you realize you're you're still making like two thousand nine hundred and fifty bucks after you liquidate those last 20 units. So a lot of sellers, they usually don't look at the full picture to be like, wow, this is actually a really good product. It's just the tail end of the inventory I got to drop for a loss. But when I look at the big picture, I'm very profitable, right? So we're first analyzing 365 day profit. Then what we're analyzing is the loss, right? What's the calculated loss at the listed price? Say I got hundred units and I'm losing $5 every time I sell it. So the loss, if I was to sell through that inventory, would be $500, right? So now you got your 365-day profit. You got the cost if you were to liquidate the inventory. And now the third number you got to figure out is what's it going to cost me to remove this item? So if you go to Seller Central and you search removal order fees, they'll give you a breakdown. Keep in mind, removal order fees have gotten very high. They doubled in the past year. So if you're trying to remove a 10-pound product, you're talking at like an 8 eight to ten dollar removal order storage fee i mean removal order fee which is crazy that is ridiculously high right so you got to analyze that as well because now you have 365 day profit then you have the loss at the current price and now you have the removal order fee so we said what you were losing 500 dollars if you sold through and let's say the removal order fee is 10 bucks and you got 100 units so if you remove it you're, you're losing a thousand dollars Right? Because then what are you going to do with the inventory when it gets back to your house? 
So like we're running these numbers before we're just liquidating inventory, right? I want to know what the best decision for my company is to keep the most of my profit, right? Which out without wasting tons of time trying to figure that out. So we created an Excel file for that, right? We fill it out. And then what we do is once a week, we pop in and we review these products with our buyers because our buyers are the ones who purchase them. They need to know why their products aren't selling. So we pop them open and we analyze them together to train them to make educated, better buying decisions in the future. It's usually 5% for buy box eligibility, but it depends also on the, on the, the selling price. You know, because 5% on a $500 product is, what, 25 bucks? So, you know, a difference of 25 bucks for buy box is, is pretty large, but, you know, 5% on a, on a $20 product is, is much less. So um, it really depends on the cost of the product. Three events that are coming up that I'll be attending. SellerCon in Austin, it's on the beginning of this month, first and second. Uh, we'll be doing some sort of meetup there at a local eatery or something, or maybe at the hotel. Um, at the beginning of August is Ecom Summit in Chicago. This is a brand new event. It's more of an educational, right? So there's some heavy hitter speakers in there. Um, we'll be delivering a ton of information. Me and Sebastian will be there. Uh, Norm Ferrer, I think. Vanessa Hung. A few other people will be there. It's more educational, which is going to be really cool, more intimate. Um, and then at the end of August, and I believe the 30th, is AMZ United, uh, which is Scott Needham, and I think a few other people are putting that together. Uh, yeah.